So uh, my talk will be about a joint work with Massimiliano Berti. So concerning Lombos global solutions for the periodic gra gravity capillarity uh, equation. So we, we consider a fluid, say water, which lies uh, between a uh, uh, flat bottom uh, given by this line and a free surface which is a graph of some function y equals eta of t and of x. So this uh, function eta will be uh, periodic and uh, we assume that the fluid is incompressible and irrotational. Uh, so that uh, in the water the velocity of the fluid will be given by the gradient of some potential phi and phi will solve the Laplace equation Laplacian phi equals zero. And we assume uh, a boundary condition at the bottom, which is that the normal derivative of phi should vanish. And so if we are given the value of this potential on the free surface, we may, uh, solving this equation, deduce the value of phi and solve the velocity everywhere. So the motion of the fluid is, it, is determined by the function eta and by the restriction psi of capital phi to the free surface. And so if you write uh, the early equations inside the water, and if you write a convenient boundary condition at the free surface, you get uh, an evolution equation for eta and psi, uh, which is uh, the so-called craig sulem zakharov formulation of the gravity capillarity wave equations that I describe now. So, the first equation in that system is dt eta equals g of eta psi, where g of eta is the dirichlet neumann operator, which is defined in the following way. So given a uh, function psi, you solve uh, the Dirichlet problem with boundary value psi, and so you find a potential capital phi, and then you compute the normal derivative of that potential, dy phi minus dx eta dx phi, uh, at the free surface y equals eta of t n of x. And this defines g of eta psi, which is just, just uh, the usual Dirichlet Neumann operator. The second equation uh, says that dt psi is given by some uh, complicated expression, say minus g eta minus one half of dx psi to the square plus g of eta acting on psi plus dx psi dx eta to the square divided by twice one plus dx eta to the square plus kappa h of eta where uh, h of eta is some explicit function that's the direct derivative of eta prime over square root of one plus eta prime square eta prime denoting just dx eta and so we have two parameters in that equation, namely g, which is the gravity, and kappa, which is the surface tension. So we shall consider these equations when x uh, belongs to T1, that is, we consider these equations with uh, functions which are periodic in x, uh, and we want uh, to solve uh, that system for long time. So let me give some known results. So I shall not read all the names which are on this slide. I will just say that concerning local existence theory for the preceding system with smooth enough data, uh, the most uh, basic work was due to C. Wu, was proved that when uh, x belongs to R or R2 instead of T1, when kappa, the surface tension is zero, and when the fluid has infinite depths, that local solutions exist over some time interval. So that then there have been quite a lot of other works uh, treating different other cases. Uh, the only one I shall mention explicitly is the one of Schweizer, which obtained local existence in the periodic framework for finite depths and for positive kappa, that is, uh, the problem we're interested in. 
And then there have been quite a lot of works devoted to long time existence when you consider small and decaying data. So in that case, you may exploit the dispersive properties of the equation so that the solutions of the linearized equation will decay when time goes to infinity. And this allows you to prove that if moreover the data are small and smooth, then you may get a solution defined over a long time interval and uh, even in some cases, a global solutions. So I shall not uh, read all uh, these uh, <coughs> name of, of contributors. I will just say that uh, there are nevertheless also uh, some results which have been obtained when you uh, consider a periodic, uh, not necessarily periodic, but say uh, data which do not decay uh, at infinity. By uh, uh, Ifrim and Tataru, and also by uh, Al Azhar Burk and Zuli. And uh, well, it has been shown in different cases that, say, for instance, for uh, a periodic uh, Cauchy data, you have a, a so called cubic lifespan. That is, if you take Cauchy data of size epsilon, you get solutions defined over an interval of time of length epsilon to the minus 2, while local existence theory provides a solution defined over an interval of time of length epsilon to the minus 1. And so what we want to do is to try under convenient assumption to do better than uh, getting this uh, cubic uh, lifespan. Uh, well, you should ask this question to Daniel and uh, Mihail Ifrim. I guess that this is because uh, quadratic, this corresponds to uh, a quadratic nonlinearity. And then when you uh, have local, um, local existence theory, you get 1 over epsilon. If you have a cubic nonlinearity, you get 1 over epsilon to the square. But of course, here the nonlinearity is quadratic. And nevertheless, you get this cubic uh, lifespan. Uh, so, so that's why the, the origin, I guess, of. Uh, the terminology. So, so let me give uh, the assumptions we shall be working with. Uh, let me introduce uh, some operator, just this matrix S, which is a matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And let me say that a solution, eta psi of uh, our capillarity gravity system, is reversible if and only if when we compute the value of the solution at time minus t it is equal to the matrix S acting on the solution computed at time t. So of course it follows immediately from this equality that uh, if uh, this uh, property holds then the second component psi has to vanish at time t equals zero. And conversely, if you start from a Cauchy data whose second component vanishes at time zero, then your solution will be reversible that it will satisfy this equality. And this just follows from the fact that your equation may be written as, uh, say, eta dot psi dot equals some uh, function f of eta psi, where f has the property that making act this matrix S uh, at the left on f of eta psi, you get something which is equal to minus f of s of eta psi. And so you deduce immediately from that property that under that assumption, the solution is reversible. And so to state the main theorem, uh, I will use uh, this property of reversibility, and I will use also a couple of notation that I introduced now. So we shall look for the first component, eta, of uh, our solution in uh, a Sobolev space, h s plus 1 over 4, of uh, t1. So periodic functions which are Sobolev on, on, on each period. We shall assume, moreover, that these functions are even. And we shall assume that the average of eta is zero. 
So if these properties are satisfied at the initial time, then they hold for any positive time as a consequence of the structure of the equation. So concerning the second component of uh, eta psi, psi, we shall take it in a space, uh, ensemble space, h s minus 1 over 4, of even functions on, on the torus, on t1, and I've actually I'm taking uh, an homogeneous sobless space that is a sobless space modulo constants. So we do that because uh, the system is actually well defined on functions modulo constants. So we may consider the second equation of the system, the one uh, on psi as projected on uh, functions modulo constants. And it's natural to do so because uh, actually only uh, the gradient of psi, if you want, has a physical meaning, not psi itself. And now that I've introduced these notations and uh, definitions, I may state the main theorem. So the theorem says that you may find a zero measure subset, capital N, of zero plus infinity to the square, and for any couple G kappa of gravity and surface tension taken outside this subset of zero measure for any given integer capital N and there is uh, some uh, index of regularity at zero, large enough such that if you take uh, any S larger than a zero well you may find some positive constants, C, epsilon zero, such that for any epsilon smaller than epsilon zero, for any function eta zero in the sobless space that I introduced above with zero average and even, with norm in that space smaller than epsilon, if you solve your capillarity gravity system with Cauchy data at t equals zero given by eta zero and zero, then you get a unique solution, continuous on some interval with values in uh, the natural sobless space, where the length of the interval of existence is bounded from below by c epsilon to the minus n. So in other words, the theorem says that you may get almost global solutions, that is solutions defined on an interval of lengths epsilon to the minus n for any given a priori n. If you take Cauchy data which are small enough, which are smooth enough, which are reversible in that sense, in the, in the sense that the second component should be zero at t equals zero, and if, moreover, you have taken your parameters outside some exceptional subset of zero measure. So before uh, giving some uh, elements of, of proof, let me make a, a remark, uh, which is that uh, actually you may reduce to the case when g equals 1, just using the homogeneities of the equation, and then the parameter that you take outside a subset of zero measure is just the parameter kappa. And let me say also that this theorem provides almost global solutions for the Cauchy problem under the assumptions that I indicated. We do not know if one can obtain uh, global solutions for the Cauchy problem. Or but Sorry? Or e to the 1 over epsilon. Or, or, or even e to the 1 over epsilon. We do not know that. Uh, but there are, on the other hand, there are non trivial examples of global solutions, that is, uh, quasi time quasi periodic solutions, which have been constructed by Berti and Montalto, and which will be the subject of the talk of Massimiliano tomorrow. And do you have but some is it uh, more? Is it with zero? So it's your initial data is special? The initial data is special because we want to have these reversible solutions 
So, so this corresponds to functions which satisfy the properties that I wrote before, eta psi no, times no, t no, equals. No, no, no problem, but uh, if you don't want. <laughs> no, but he, no, he, we, we need these yes, assumptions, no, and I, I shall explain I why later. Need, but is it true or not, you think? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm not the kind of person who's making conjectures on the air, so I will <laughs> not. <laughs> so what is true in physics? No, uh, uh, psi. 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 No, psi physically, that's the, the restriction of, of the potential to the restriction of the potential to the free surface. So if it's zero, then there's zero initial velocities. You raise yeah. the surface and then you let it go, but with ah, no okay. initial so velocities. No... Okay. okay, so uh, now we shall, uh, in a first step, uh, try to forget the explicit uh, expression of the equation and reduce ourselves to some parallel differential formulation. So, First of all, let me fix some notations. So if A is a symbol, so say a function of x and xi, such that d xi beta A uh, is bounded from above by xi power m minus beta for a given m and any beta, when associate to this A uh, an operator, a parallel operator, in the following way, one takes chi, some uh, cutoff function with small enough support uh, equal to 1 close to 0. And one defines from uh, the function a, a new function, a chi, in the following way. One takes the free transform of a relatively to the x variable. This gives a hat of x hat xi. One multiplies by the cutoff chi of x hat of xi and takes inverse free transform. And then in that way, you define uh, the Bonivell quantization of uh, the function A as the operator associating to some test function U a new function given by this integral, 1 over 2 pi, integral e to the i x minus y xi, a chi of x plus y over 2 and of xi, u of y, dy, xi. So in that way, one gets uh, an operator which uh, is bounded from hs to hs minus m for any s. If you assume, moreover, that your symbol a is periodic in x, your operator will send a periodic uh, well, functions of hs of t1 to functions of hs minus m of t1. And then, using uh, the celebrated bonus parallelization formula, you may rewrite your equation, the equation we started from as a parallel equation. That is, you may write the initial equation under the following form. You have capital DT, where capital DT will be 1 over i d over DT, minus the operator associated to a matrix of symbols, capital A. These symbols depend on eta psi because we treat a nonlinear equation. And all that operator acting on the unknown eta psi should be equal to some smoothing operator, that is an operator that will gain raw derivatives for rho a given large number that we may choose if we work in spaces of smoothing functions, acting on it upside. So usually, when you do that from a nice uh, quasi-linear republic equation, you uh, end up with a, a system for which you can get easily some energy estimates and then eventually local existence theory. Well, in the case of the water wave equation, it is well known that when you do that, you get uh, into trouble because the matrix of symbols A that you get uh, has eigenvalues whose imaginary part goes to infinity when psi goes to infinity. In other words, you have uh, instabilities 
which uh, prevent you from getting uh, energy estimate without derivative losses from such a formulation when uh, you uh, apply this polarization uh, method to uh, a water wave equation. So this problem has been solved uh, years ago. Uh, first of all, par by C.J. Wu, who designed some uh, Lagrangian formulation of uh, the equations that uh, allow one to overcome the difficulty. Can I say something about that? That, that Nalimov invented that. Yeah, but it was for small data. But it's the same formulation. Yeah. Okay. It's the same calculation. <laughs> so then uh, there has been another approach that has been used, relying on the so-called good unknown of Alinac by Alazar Metivier, Alazar Bergvili, Lan. And this is uh, the, the method we shall adopt. And then, uh, more recently, Anteri Frim and Tataru proposed a third approach using some uh, holomorphic coordinates. And so, we shall use, as I said, this uh, good unknown approach, which uh, consists in saying that uh, this problem that I was mentioning comes from the fact that uh, we didn't use the good uh, unknowns to express a problem, and that instead of writing uh, the equation on uh, e top psi, as I did, one should introduce instead omega, which is psi minus, well, some operator acting on, bit, on eta, where uh, b, the symbol of this operator, is just a function, an explicit function, g of eta psi, plus dx psi dx eta divided by 1 plus dx eta to the square. And it turns out that if you write the system in these unknowns, then things are much better. So more precisely, if we start from eta psi, a solution of our equation defined on some time interval, let me introduce a, a complex unknown in the following way. Call lambda kappa of d, the operator d, hyperbolic tangent of d divided by 1 plus kappa d squared to the 1 over 4. This is an operator of order minus 1 over 4. And defined from uh, the good unknown uh, omega and from eta, a complex valued function, u, which is just lambda kappa of d omega plus i, lambda kappa of d minus 1, eta. Next, introduce capital U, the vector U, U bar, and write your equation uh, under a, a parallelized form on capital U. So when you do that, you obtain the following. Well, capital DT minus the operator with symbol, a new matrix of symbols, capital A of u dx xi acting on u equals some smoothing operator R of u acting on u. And now what is important is uh, the information we have on the structure of that matrix A. So A is a, a matrix of symbols of order three halves. So the main contribution in, in terms of, of the order is given by some Fourier multiplier, m kappa of xi, where m kappa of xi is given explicitly by xi hyperbolic tangent of xi power one half times one plus kappa xi square to the one half. So this is a symbol of order three halves, which is multiplied by 1 plus zeta of utx, zeta being some real valued function, uh, multiplied by this matrix, uh, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And you have also another contribution over the three halves, m kappa zeta, multiplied by a matrix, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. 
Then you have also contributions of positive but lower order, namely lambda one half of u times some matrix, and lambda one of u times the identity matrix. These two symbols of of order one half and one respectively, so they are of positive order, but it turns out that their imaginary part is of order j minus 1, so of uh, uh, negative order, well, or at least non-positive order for lambda 1. And then you have contributions of non-positive order given by symbols lambda minus 1 half of order minus 1 half, lambda 0 of order 0. And what is important here is that uh, uh, when you compute the eigenvalues of that new matrix, you get that the imaginary part of these eigenvalues is bounded when Xi goes to infinity, which was a property which was not true in the initial formulation. And this property comes from the fact that using the good unknown, you make appear a symbol lambda one half here, which has the imaginary part of negative order, while, while if you are doing that starting from the initial unknowns psi and eta instead of omega and eta, you would have got a similar expression, but the imaginary part of this uh, symbol would have been of order still one half, and this is what would be responsible for the fact that the eigenvalues of the matrix would have had imaginary part also of order one half that may go to infinity when psi goes to infinity. And this is uh, the, the point that creates uh, instability in uh, the initial formulation. So now that we have this form of uh, the equation, let me also introduce uh, uh, three properties satisfied by the matrix of symbols A that will play an essential role. So recall that I define reversibility using some uh, linear operator S and uh, now I will call S the matrix minus 0, 1, 1, 0. That's just a translation of the same operator, but on the new basis we are using in the complex formulation of our equation. And the matrix of symbols that uh, you get uh, in, uh, for the expression of your system satisfies three properties. The, one, the first one say that if you compute this matrix of symbol A at u, t, x, minus xi and conjugate it, you get minus S, A of u, t, x, xi, S. So this property just means that when you consider the associated operator, make it act on V and take the conjugate, what you obtain is minus S, the operator with symbol A, acting on S, acting on V bar. And this property is a, is a property that just reflects the fact that we are working with a system on capital U, which is U, U bar, where the second equation of the system is obtained from the first one by conjugation. So this is just uh, a property coming from the fact that we started from an equation, from a system with real valued functions. The second property satisfied by the matrix A is that a of u t minus x minus xi is equal to a of u t x xi. And this means that the associated operator, in particular, preserves even functions, which is a property we need since we shall be working with even functions. And finally, uh, the third property is uh, the so-called reversibility which says that if you compute the matrix A at SU T X Xi, uh, it is equal to minus S A of U T X Xi S. So the meaning of this property is as follows. If you consider the right hand side of uh, our system, which was op A of U acting on U, and if you apply to it S, this is equal to minus the operator 
this symbol A of SU acting on SU. And this just reflects the fact that the system is reversible. Uh, the properties that I used before when I wrote that uh, S of some function f of eta psi was equal to minus f of s of eta psi. So that's the third property we shall be using to uh, obtain the result of log time existence. And now let me give some ideas on the proof. So the first step is a sequence of reductions that have been used in other contexts by Alzabaldi, by Bedi Montalto. So I will not give any detail about these reductions. I will just say that make, making a diagonalization of the symbol of your operator. And then making some change of variable, or actually some paracomposition, and making conjugations by convenient free integral operators, you may reduce the system that I wrote before to a system which has constant coefficients. So in other words, you may introduce some new unknown, capital V, uh, that may be expressed explicitly from U, that will be of the same size of U in HS when both terms are small enough. And such that this new unknown will solve a new equation that may be written as follows. So you have capital DT minus M kappa of DX, the Fourier multiplier that I introduced before, uh, which is DX hyperbolic tangent of DX to the one half, one plus kappa squared DX square to the one half times some function, 1 plus uh, zeta underline of u and of t, which is only a function of t. So this, this operator is a constant coefficient operator at fixed time. So this multiplies the matrix, the diagonal matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And then you have another operator, capital H of u, t, dx, where capital H is also a diagonal matrix of constant coefficient few different operators, which are uh, over the one. And what is important is that the imaginary part of uh, the symbol H is of order zero, while H itself is of order one. And finally, this operator H satisfies the properties, the three properties that I introduced before, the reality, parity preservation, and reversibility conditions. And in the right-hand side of the equation, you have R of U acting on V, where R is again some smoothing operator that satisfies also these uh, three uh, properties. So in other words, we have reduced ourselves to a new equation where in the left hand side you have just constant coefficient operators. And so it's very easy now to get energy estimates on that equation. Well, uh, actually, when uh, you make uh, an energy estimate on such an equation, the real part of H uh, gives a self adjoint operator which disappears in energy estimates. And so what you are left with is just the contributions coming from the imaginary part of H, which is an operator of order zero, so an operator which is bounded on L2. And moreover, since we have constant coefficients, we may commute as many derivatives as we want, and so we, we can write as well uh, L2 or Sobolev uh, energy estimates. So in other words, if you write on the preceding equation a uh, very basic energy estimate, you get that the Sobolev norm of the solution at time t is bounded by the Sobolev norm at time zero. 
plus constant the integral from 0 to t of uh, the operator imaginary part of h of u to dx acting on v at time tau in hs d tau. So if we knew in addition that this symbol imaginary part of h not only is over the zero but that it vanishes like norm of u in hs to the n when u goes to zero then the proof will be finished because in this case we could write the preceding inequality saying that the sublevel norm of v at time t is bounded by the sublevel norm of v at time zero plus an integral from zero to t of uh, say norm of u at time tau in hs power n norm of v at time tau in hs d tau and since we work with Cauchy data of size epsilon, and since we aim at propagating the fact that the solution stays of such a size over some time interval, morally in this integral, this norm of u to the n is of size epsilon to the n, so that some elementary bootstrap argument will show you that uh, if you consider this inequality only for times smaller than c divided by epsilon to the n for small positive c, then uh, you will be able to prove an a priori bound saying that uh, the left hand side is more than k times epsilon, where k is some fixed constant. And so this a priori bound will tell you that the solution may be extended up to such a time. But of course, uh, to do so, uh, we will need to have this property that the imaginary part of A vanishes like a large power of u when u goes to zero. And uh, this is not true. Im h vanishes like uh, u power one when u goes to zero. So we have to do a first step in order to arrive to such a property. And so this step will be a normal forms method. So to explain this, let me call B of capital U Xi some diagonal matrix of symbols of order zero to be determined. And let me look for uh, again a new uh, variable, a new unknown, V tilde, given by the exponential of b of u t dx acting on v. So in other words, I'm starting from the equation that was on the preceding slide, namely dt minus m cap of dx times 1 plus d underline 1 0 0 minus 1 plus h of u t dx acting on v equals some smoothing operator acting on v. And what I'm doing is just that I uh, intertwine this operator by this exponential. So since I have a constant coefficient operators, uh, this uh, exponential of b of u t dx commutes with all these operators. And so when I'm uh, making the conjugation of this equation by this exponential, the only new contribution that will appear will come from uh, the conjugation of dt with xb, that is, I will get another term, dtb of u t dx. So that the new unknown v tilde satisfies uh, an equation which is uh, capital dt minus dtb of u t dx minus m kappa of dx 1 plus d underline 1 0 0 minus 1 plus h of u t dx v tilde equals r of u v tilde. And now, uh, what we have to do, since uh, I recall that what we want to, to do is to get rid of the contributions to the imaginary part of h that are um, vanishing when u goes to zero at the order lower than some uh, u to the n for a given n. So in other words, what we want to do is to choose uh, 
capital B such that this term will cancel the contributions to coming from MH that do not vanish at large order when you go to zero. So why do you worry only about cancelling the contribution from H and not uh, uh, R? Oh, uh, no, of, of course. I have also to do the same thing for R uh, later. Of course, of course. But here I'm... You know, the, the method is pretty much the same in both cases, and so I, uh, I explain it on, on H. So I have to choose B so that DTB minus i imaginary part of h of u tx xi should vanish like u to the n when u goes to the n. So to construct b, I'm looking for it as a sum of uh, uh, expressions bp of u u u which are homogeneous of degree p, p going from 1 up to n minus 1 the last uh, degree that I want to cancel out, each BP being some P linear map that are restricted to the diagonal U equals U, U1 equals U2, etc. So now let me compute DTB. When I compute DTB, uh, the T derivative will act successively on each argument of BP. And I will replace the corresponding DTU using the equation, which was that DTU is some Fourier multiplier m kappa of dx times some matrix k, which was 1, 0, 0, minus 1, acting on capital U, plus some nonlinear terms, which will generate contributions of higher degree of homogeneity. So if, you, if, I, if I write what I get uh, at the level of uh, the contributions homogeneous of degree p, so I will get bp in which I have replaced one of the arguments by the linear part of the equation, this uh, j corresponding to the place of this argument going from 1 to p. The nonlinearities will give uh, terms of higher degree of homogeneity that I may forget at that level. And I want to choose BP in order to get rid of the contribution to uh, MH homogeneous of degree P that I may write as some image report of HP of U, U, TXI. And now this is essentially the equation to which I reduce myself to finish the proof. So I wrote again that equation at the top of this slide. And to solve it, let me decompose each, each argument capital U as a sum of pi as a sum in n of pi n plus capital U plus pi n minus capital U. Where what I denoted by pi n is just the spectral projector associated to the nth eigen mode of the Laplacian on the circle. And where, since capital U is a two-vector, the plus and the minus denote projection on the first or the second component on that vector. So if I replace uh, each argument U by such a decomposition, and if I look at what happens when I make act this operator on, for instance, pi n plus capital U, uh, one sees immediately that uh, the result of this operation acting on such a localized uh, function uh, is given by multiplication of the function by the symbol m kappa computed at n. So in other words, when uh, we write uh, the preceding equation replacing the arguments by pi n1 plus u, pi nl plus u, pi nl plus 1 minus u, up to pi np minus u, uh, when you make act this operator on one of the first L terms, you just get multiplication by m kappa of nj with a plus sign. And of course, this uh, multiplication by a function may 
move out of VP by linearity. In the same way, for the last terms, when you make act uh, such an operator on the last terms, you get multiplication by some m kappa of nj with a minus sign. So that finally, when you compute this uh, left hand side, uh, where you replace each argument by a spectrally localized one, what you, what you obtain is just uh, BP computed at these arguments multiplied by some function, dl, which is just given by this sum from m cap of nj from 1 to l minus the same sum from l plus 1 to p. So our problem is to determine BP to, in order that the equation be satisfied, and so we have just to divide by dl, and so we have to know that dl is not zero. So clearly, there is a case when dl will be zero, whatever you do, which is a case when you have uh, the same number of terms in both sums, and when you have a two by two cancellations between uh, one term in the first term and one term in the second one. This may happen. In this case, dl will be identically zero. And so I have to distinguish two cases. The first one being the case when such uh, a scenario does not happen. So let me assume that I am not in the preceding case. That is in the case when p is even, l is p over 2, and the set n1 and l coincide with nl plus 1 np. Since in this, in this case, dl, the function dl vanishes identically. So the lemma says that if you are not in this case, then if the parameter kappa, surface tension, is taken outside a convenient subset of zero measure, then you may ensure uh, um, a small divisors estimate saying that not only dl does not vanish, but moreover, dl is bounded from below by a constant times n1 plus it represents p power minus some integer n0. So in other words, when we are not in the forbidden case, we shall be able to divide by dl. Uh, that is, we shall be able to, to, to solve the equation we were interested in, dl times bl equals i in part of hl since the L does not vanish. So of course, when we make such a division, we lose some large power of n1 plus np, which means that we lose some derivatives on the coefficients of our equation. But this does not matter because these, uh, the coefficients of the equation are low frequencies, and that is, we may afford to, to lose uh, a large number of derivatives on these uh, coefficients, if, of course, we work with smooth enough functions. OK, so this solves the equation uh, we wanted to study in the case uh, 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 which, uh, except in the case p even, l equals p over 2, and n1 l n l equals n l plus 1 n. As we have seen, in that case, this dl will vanish identically whatever the value of the parameter kappa. And so, to solve the equation in that last case, we use the three properties that I was mentioning, reality, parity preservation, and reversibility. Because combining these three properties, one may check that uh, the right-hand side of the equation, uh, im uh, hl, or, well, im hp in, in this case, uh, computed at pi 1 plus u up to pi p minus u, u with uh, n1 and p satisfying this equality, vanishes identically. So that in the remaining case, the equation to be solved was just 0 equals 0, and we know how to solve such an equation. And so consequently, we have been able to solve, in all cases, this uh, equation. And uh, we have seen before that solving this equation was allowing one to eliminate the contributions to IMHL, which have a low degree of homogeneity, and that doing that 
we are able to uh, get by energy inequality our long time uh, existent result over an interval of time of length epsilon to minus n and being uh, the level at which uh, we uh, stop this process of uh, elimination. So this concludes uh, so the proof of the theorem and this concludes also my talk which is fortunate because uh, my time is essentially over. Are there some questions? So that's a very interesting cancellation in this uh, in this uh, reversible and yeah. and parity setting. So, uh, in the general case, that is allowing cosines and sines of x. I, I, I mean, because those, those uh, somehow from my Hamiltonian point of view, those terms are very important, and those are ones which which really are important to the dynamics. Yeah, and so I, yeah, and so I, I imagine that, yeah, they they what cause the uh, action uh, exactly. frequency uh, uh, non degeneracy. So I'm just uh, wondering what happens in the general case. So you know, in the general case, you know what uh, what one is able to do in other settings, and what one would, do, would like to be able to do uh, here would be to use the fact that the equation is Hamiltonian, and then the terms uh, that uh, you cannot uh, eliminate, elim uh, eliminate the terms for which this DL vanishes, correspond to terms depending only on the actions. So these terms, and these, so these terms, they cannot grow. Their, their Sobolev norms do not grow because they depend just, just on the actions. And so these are terms that you do not need to eliminate in a Birkhoff normal form using the Hamiltonian character of the equation. And so why didn't we uh, do, uh, use this approach? Well, this is because of the good unknown that I introduced before. When you pass from the initial unknown to the good unknown, the reversibility condition is trivially preserved. But uh, the point is that the passage from the good unknown to the new, un to from, from the old unknown to the new unknown, uh, is not something that is Hamiltonian, or at least we do not know to do that in an Hamiltonian way. Yeah. If you, we could, say, uh, design some Hamiltonian way of uh, doing that step, then I'm pretty confident that we could write the whole proof in the Hamiltonian framework. And so get rid of these conditions of uh, parity and uh, and reversibility. Sorry, I think um, some other question. But that doesn't work in this case. In any case, yeah. sorry, that would not work in this case. You have to go to another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah another point of view. Uh, Maybe I have a short question concerning the, uh, this property, the, the one you spoke. So uh, uh, usually the papers I know the parameter is in the zero order term of the of the symbol. So here your kappa is in the main part of the symbol, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's something which I never saw. It, it, it makes really a difference in the analysis. Or? Well, uh, I did not mention much about this minoration dl. How you prove it? Mm. Oh, so, no, so, so this, is, this follows from essentially from some uh, old result with uh, Jeremy, which was applying to uh, uh, say to some uh, general functions, subalentic functions satisfying some uh, conditions. So the fact that the so the fact that it depends uh, this m kappa, uh, which was uh, written. Uh, here, so the fact that this, uh, you know, the fact that the, the kappa here is in front of uh, a derivative of i order does not matter at all in the proof of uh, this uh, this lower bound. Uh, so you, you what, what 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 is important is the fact that when you consider this function as a function of psi, the dependence on kappa is essentially a non-trivial dependence, and this is what allows you to uh, to. Uh, uh, to obtain this uh, small device or uh, estimate, at least to, to say that when you evaluate this, or well, actually what I call DL only at integers, uh, then uh, moving a little bit kappa, you may arrange so that uh, these uh, uh, lower bounds are, are satisfied. So the fact that kappa is here or here 
does not uh, does not matter at all. Actually, you could no factor out kappa and uh, get a parameter here, and you won't change anything. I see. Okay. In terms of the method of proof, can you make a comparison with the result of uh, of the Taru and Fring? Which so, was an of epsilon, of epsilon. So, well, so uh, the, ba the basic point, you know, with, with the basic starting point is the same, that is, you want to get rid of uh, terms of lower degree in the nonlinearity. So to get their cubic result, you have to get rid of the quadratic term of the nonlinearity. No oh, no, no. In, in their case, there is no parameter, but this is because this is... Yeah, they don't have for the so you have parameters. Yeah, but the point is that they don't have parameter because it's at the level of the quadratic uh, nonlinearity for which you will have essentially no uh, resonance. No, no And they don't but need disparity condition also. So they don't need disparity condition also. They don't need disparity condition, but disparity condition actually we need it only, uh, you know, to, to, to deal with the terms, uh, the bad terms, the ones for which you, your, you cannot make non-zero your function DL. And so you need it only to get rid of terms of uh, odd degree in your nonlinearity. You need it to get rid of a cubic term. You do not need it. You do not need it to get rid of a, a quadratic term or a, or a quartic term. Okay. okay. So up to up to those cubic terms, you will be, the proof will be the same. Uh, yeah. 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 Except that it's not exactly the same framework. Point in Tatao and Fremis, they don't have zero measures. They have every kappa. Yeah. Yeah. You have kappa except zero measures. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So you you not you would you be able to recover that result? In other words, without the generic condition. Well, I, I suppose we could, but we we didn't try to to write it down. We 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 wrote you know the general thing. Uh, 